All right, hopefully you have intentionally come to the next steps for a Drupal Commerce session. Uh, if not, uh, my feelings will not be hurt if you need to go find a different room. I am Ryan Zarama, and I am married to Christina and a father of two. As of last year, William's actually a little bit bigger now. Uh, we live in South Carolina, um, in Greenville. It's the upstate uh, near Asheville, North Carolina. If folks have come out east, it's a really nice place to visit. And hopefully it'll be a nice place to have a Drupal camp one day. That's, that's a sort of long-term goal of mine. Um, but in the meantime, I fly around to events like DrupalCon Portland uh, and every other DrupalCon since Barcelona to talk uh, really Drupal-powered e-commerce um, in general. At first, it was using uh, Drupal with Ubercart. And that was my first e-commerce system developed on Drupal 5. And then in 2009, early 2010, with Commerce Guys, we undertook to develop this new e-commerce system on Drupal 7 called Drupal Commerce. I won't be providing a whole lot of background information on the core framework itself. I'm going to assume that uh, since it's been out for a few years now, we have a, a general idea of what it is um, in the room. If not, I will have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, but the gist of it is that it is just an e-commerce framework uh, that facilitates any type of e-commerce experience on your Drupal site. So you install these modules and you get a shopping cart, a, check a checkout form, uh, an address book, customer profiles, all that kind of stuff it does. Um, but what we're talking about here in this session is what's next for Drupal Commerce. Because we have uh, Drupal Commerce itself, we also have Commerce Kickstart, which some of you may have seen the, uh, the demo um, at our booth in the Commerce Village. Um, we have that, which uh, sort of uh, provides a full store out of the box as a distribution of Drupal that includes uh, Drupal 7 with Drupal Commerce with a couple of themes and uh, Augustin could correct me, but I'm sure it's about 100 additional modules um, that are supplying a bunch of other functionality for the store. Um, we also have the Commerce Marketplace, which is in development and is itself a next step uh, because the Marketplace is, is a continual work in progress. It's the place where we connect commerce sites to the third-party service providers that make e-commerce truly work at scale. And because there's only so much that you can do through your one website, uh, you, you're going to have to depend on um, analytic services, payment services for sure, um, fulfillment services, accounting, CRM, etc. So we will continue to build out the marketplace, and I'll talk a little bit about that and show what that looks like um, in the back end of Commerce Kickstart. We're also here at DrupalCon Portland to um, kind of demo, unveil, launch the private beta of the Commerce Mobile offering, which you can see on my phone afterwards if you're curious. Uh, it's a, a mobile app that uses the Commerce Services module and a, and a variety of configuration modules to expose your Commerce Kickstart store to um, a native iOS mobile app uh, that's been built in Titanium, so it could also work on Android. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in, uh, later in the session. And then we have Commerce Platform, which is, uh, as I said, in a private beta. You can come get on the beta list. We'll be sending invites out, I believe, over the next couple of weeks. Um, to launch the, the full final offering at DrupalCon Prague. Um, in the meantime, I look forward to seeing some of you testing it for us, even as I test it with my own site. Ah, and a bit of background information um, aside from my work in Drupal, I'm also a cheesemonger. Um, I eat my own dog food and use Drupal Commerce to sell Amish-made raw milk cheese online. Um, so I, I like to say that Drupal Commerce has successfully got at least one Amish farmer to sign up for email. Um, <laughs> So that was a major achievement of mine. And then within Commerce Guys, um, I am uh, the leader of our R&D team, which is myself and one other person, Josh Miller, at the front of the room here, um, who helps me maintain DrupalCommerce.org, write documentation, communicate about commerce in general, so that all of you here know how to solve your problems. And if you have a problem that you don't know how to solve, I strongly recommend you assault Josh after the session and, and see what he can uh, do for you. Um, but once we get into talking about what's, what's going on right now in the broader Drupal Commerce ecosystem, we will talk specifically about how the framework itself is going to mature and evolve over the next year, year and a half, as we make the transition from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And that may be part of the big reveal, is just that Drupal Commerce will not have a second version, a 2.x branch on Drupal 7. We'll be jumping straight to uh, Drupal 8, and I'll discuss some of the implications about that toward the end of our time today. 
Uh, and I have a note here in my presenter notes that's so handy. Uh, after my presentation this evening, uh, at our booth, Samit Kataria, who's been our, our uh, go-to guy for mobile app development, will be doing a demo um, in the little commerce saloon on the back end of our uh, booth, uh, just so you can actually see the whole thing um, in progress, uh, or you can come steal my phone afterwards and check it out as well. And there are demos of the commerce platform at the booth. Um, you can find Damien Tourney at our CTO, and he's really happy to, to work through that and show that off and use my cheese site as an example. So before, I, before we go any further, I do want to remind us all and remind myself of the big idea. This is how I've introduced uh, all of my Drupal Commerce presentations, at least since DrupalCon Chicago. And it's the idea that, that our vision at Commerce Guys is for Drupal Commerce, and, and by extension Drupal itself, to be the number one open source e-commerce framework in the world. Uh, we want to beat uh, my predecessor and former project Ubercart. We want to beat Magento. We want to beat PrestaShop overseas. Um, we want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys and win. Um, within Commerce Guys, we are doing it against them and against Demandware and Hybris and ATG when we uh, go out and bid on large projects. But we, we also want to beat them at just a, a mass market, broader adoption um, a metric. So we want you to be a part of that. We want to cast that vision, keep that vision before you. And, and, and I say this because I think it's truly possible because with Drupal Commerce, with Drupal itself being so flexible and moving so fast and making such rapid advances, especially when you look at Drupal 8 versus Drupal 7, we think that we can power truly flexible e-commerce that would make Drupal Commerce the solution for any merchant of any size in any particular you know, vertical market. Um, we don't hard code assumptions into Drupal Commerce itself so that you can actually take the framework and configure it to work for any type of store. Um, it could be a, uh, well, I guess I have a, a wall of pictures here. Um, it could be a product store selling jewelry. Uh, you could be selling subscriptions. You could be registering for DrupalCon Portland. Maybe you didn't know it, but you use Drupal Commerce to do that. Um, there, there are many different applications of Drupal Commerce. And we think that Drupal Commerce's flexibility is one of its key selling points. And so we make that point. We, we definitely make that point to developers. Uh, because that speaks to developers. None of us like being pigeonholed by a rigid system, uh, unless you're like me, and I still love developing games in basic. Um, I, I guess I like that, that, that fun sense of, of punishment when you're dealing with a 640 kilobyte memory limit and other things like that. Um, but whenever we're doing work, we want work to just uh, work and not have to deal with the frustrations of a limited system. So we don't pigeonhole anyone into any particular um, business model, checkout workflow, order management workflow, anything. It's all there for you to build from the ground up, which is, again, great for developers. We don't, uh, uh, we don't want to be uh, uh, frustrated. We don't want to have to, to un unhook or unregister hooks and modules. It's easy enough to turn off a rule or to change the way a view has been configured. Uh, let's go through here. Um, we also don't want you to be tied to a particular data model. So by depending on Drupal's fieldable entity system, you can actually construct the product data model that you want. Uh, you can then extend those with the other contributed modules that work with the field system. You have automatic integration into views, so you have a, a module like the Commerce Reports module that can actually look at your field data from all of your order history and generate uh, pretty graph reports right in the back end of your website just by having access to all of this data um, in, in, a, in a, I guess, in a manner or a format that views can understand. Uh, so we, we've always kind of pitched Drupal Commerce as this great platform or framework for developers, uh, but that's not going to make us the number one open source e-commerce framework in the world because there's only so many of us and, and only so many of us are able to take this and communicate that to an actual merchant. Um, it's great for us when we have our own projects to be able to spin something up very fast, but when you have to go and compete against someone like Magento who has eBay's marketing budget behind it, um, or any of the other major e-commerce players, you need to actually be able to speak the merchant's language. And so I, I guess I have some questions here that maybe we aren't answering um, as directly. So how will Drupal Commerce help me make money? How can I see what's happening in my store? Or even something simple for me, or it, it should be simple for me with my cheese site was, when I send out this newsletter, how much money am I actually making? And those questions can actually be difficult to answer. Um, and we, sh we should do a better job of making that simpler. Uh, what, what is this about the product data model again? Uh, you know, we, we, we definitely hit that whenever we were doing our usability testing. People um, 
and maybe this is some context that we don't all have, but in Drupal Commerce, just in the core of the framework, we separate product data definition from how a product is displayed. So you have to define, say, all the variations of a t-shirt, the different sizes and colors it may come in, and then have a node that references all those different variations to turn it into one add to cart form. And that's sort of like entity referencing, and even just the word entity is scary for a merchant or a store administrator who just wants to go add a product page and give it sizes and colors and put in a description. So whenever we, we look at the sort of development of Drupal Commerce, I'd say that like this may be frustrating, but it was actually by design because it was a matter of priority. Our first priority was to actually get an implementation of e-commerce on Drupal 7 and then uh, write Commerce Kickstart 2.x to actually make Drupal Commerce look and feel like a complete e-commerce solution. And I believe we've accomplished that if you've been able to put your hands on the demo. You can see that what you get when you install Commerce Kickstart is a store. Um, not only that, we wanted to simplify this user experience for store administrators. So when they're administering orders and managing, those, uh, managing the customer relationships, when they're adding new products to the site or managing stock or whatever, we wanted to make those routine tasks simpler. We wanted to make it easy to add messages to orders and communicate with your customers and see that trail of everything that's happened to an order. So we used Amitaibu's message module to accomplish that. So Commerce Kickstart was the point where we took the framework and started, um, started optimizing it for a particular like, market segment. In this case, it's um, you know, non-technical store administrators who are selling physical goods. So we took something that looks like, uh, something that looks like this out of the box, uh, which doesn't communicate anything except that, well, Bartik works. Um, and we made it look like this, which communicates, wow, this is a site that actually sells something. So out of the box, as soon as you install Commerce Kickstart, this is what you see. And actually, I pulled up some, uh, some tabs here to, to run through. Um, we have basically implemented on the front end um, a variety of, of e-commerce best practices um, using, obviously, big images and, and easy ways to, to advertise offers. Free shipping, of course, communicates to everyone on the internet. Um, but not just focused on like the front page branding experience, but also product catalog. So Commerce itself does not have um, any concept of the product catalog. But here in Commerce Kickstart, we've used views and the search API and Facet API to have a sort of faceted product catalog browsing experience. Um, you could browse the catalog using the normal taxonomy related menus, um, but here I can actually see the full list of demo store content, uh, which is optional on installation, then you can remove it afterwards. Um, but I can just filter down through, I, I believe it's got some Ajax functionality in here. Um, I can actually filter my search results just like you could on Newegg is kind of the common example of someone that really nailed um, faceted product searching. Uh, and then whenever I get down to an actual product page, um, we have it looking and, uh, and functioning like you might expect just an attractive um, product page to, to work like. So we actually have the image gallery with zoomable product images. And not just a select list to choose the color because, hey, we can actually make that the color itself that you're buying. So we have the Commerce Fancy Attributes module, which exists as a standalone project so that, that um, customers can come and see the color they're, they're changing to, update the whole image gallery at the same time. Um, maybe see price changes or whatever else based on the attributes that you're selecting. And then once the add to cart happens, we provide you with uh, an opportunity to, again, directly market to them to try and drive conversions. Um, so this isn't something that the core of commerce is concerned with. In, in the heart of Drupal Commerce, it's not like there's a module you can turn on that says conversion optimization. Um, but, but we're interested in conversion rates. You need to know that kind of stuff because you need to know how to, how to tool or retool the front end of your website or what recommendations engine to integrate with or how to change your, your menu hierarchy so that you can capture more sales. And maybe um, at, a, at a recent hackathon, I rigged it together so that using the, the Relify API, I was actually putting product recommendations into this modal dialog because it's just built using the views module. So it's really easy to extend this and customize it show them what else they're buying, upsell other products or related products, et cetera. So with Commerce Kickstart 2, um, we, we've tried to give merchants a lot more tools in the front end to have an easy, quick, attractive e-commerce site um, that provides them with, with places to uh, optimize for conversion. And it's actually gone so well, um, let's see if I can remember the URL and hope it loads because I wasn't planning on pulling them up, that we're starting to see submissions to the um, to the Drupal Commerce Showcase, if you go to drupalcommerce.org slash showcase, that's where that wall of images came from. We're seeing stores like this one um, that have taken Commerce Kickstart 2.x, 
changed a few colors, slapped in different images, and launched um, with, with no development required. Um, all they had to do was tweak some CSS and they had a live store that was ready to sell, in this case, 100% pure raw honey. Um, and they had the dynamic product pages. Of course, they just have one product page. Um, but, it, but it's fully dynamic thanks to the way the add to cart form works within Drupal Commerce. Um, and, and again, like for, for the merchant, like this speaks to them. In, in one day, you can turn around a new e-commerce site to sell my product. And, um, and hopefully that speaks to you as, as uh, developers and sales guys, et cetera, as well. Um, it's, it's much faster with Commerce Kickstart to deploy, um, in this case, a simple e-commerce site. But as the marketplace itself fills out, um, even more complex sites. And I'll sort of run into the back end as well, because we didn't just optimize the customer experience on the front end. Oh, Let's go here. As I mentioned, we also spent some time rethinking the way that our, our administrative views work. Because um, we wanted to simplify routine tasks. For example, editing all of the products in a particular product group. Um, so again, if you're familiar with the, uh, the architecture of commerce, um, if you're selling the t-shirt and it has four different sizes, there are four separate product entities with unique SKUs that get tied in through one product display, which is great for stock control and reporting and other things like that. Um, and some analytics and data mining, but it's not so great when it comes to actually managing a group of products at the same time. So here within this products view, I'm actually seeing a list of my product displays, and if I click this quick edit button, it will expand out this row in the view using the views mega row module, another separate module that we've released on drupal.org, to include all of the different product uh, variations that are in this display. So I can enable them, disable them, uh, tweak the price, and then make those updates right here in line in the form. And if I needed to, um, the, uh, the combo button has a drop down that would actually let me access the full node edit form um, where I can add new variations, change the images, edit the body of a product, maybe change which catalog, category it's a part of, etc. cetera. Um, our our um, node edit form also doesn't just use the standard product reference autocomplete widget. It's using what's called the inline entity form widget, which again is a separate project on D.O. Um, that's packaged into the distribution so that you can actually add, update, create, delete product entities right in line from the, the, uh, the node edit form itself. Uh, this this uh, module is not restricted just to Drupal Commerce, so it will work for other types of entities as well. So maybe if you're using a node reference or user reference or something like that, you could use the module for those cases. Um, so what, what used to require going to one interface to create a bunch of products and then another interface to create a node and then remembering all the different SKUs that are supposed to go together, well, all those steps have been collapsed into one single page where you can come and create the node, add the variations, reorder them so you have you know, different uh, sort orders perhaps for the default products selected um, and then save everything all at once. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty interesting. I'm pretty happy about it, and I'm looking forward to see how that develops on Drupal 8 because the entity reference module is now a part of core, and the inline entity form uh, will be carried over and added as a new actual dependency of Drupal Commerce itself. So Commerce Kickstart was the use case, the test case that sort of proved the concept, and then in Commerce 2.x we'll be able to depend on that and take advantage of all the work that's gone into building Commerce Kickstart 2 and making it what it is. Um, so, this is the order administration interface. Again, it looks similar to the product interface. Um, and I guess I didn't, I didn't call out everything, you know, every feature of, this, uh, of these pages uh, in the last screen. Um, but not only is it a view that uses the views mega row to expand and do like quick edit functionality. Did I just unplug? No. We also use views bulk operations for you to be able to do bulk updates to orders as you're processing a group of orders or bulk updates to products, the same thing as on those forms. Um, filtering, searching by you know, customer name, order date, order number, et cetera. All this is sort of built um, into Commerce Kickstart out of the box thanks to another separate module called Commerce Back Office. And so this is sort of a, a common reframe here as, I've, as I'm running through these screens. A lot of the functionality that's in Commerce Kickstart 2.x exists in standalone projects on Drupal.org. And the idea was we wanted you to be able to build a site um, that uses Drupal Commerce and many of these modules without having to start with Commerce Kickstart 2.x. A Drupal distribution is great for launching a new store, but once the store is launched, you can't go back and get the distribution features unless they exist as these separate projects on Drupal.org. Um, so even as every new user of Kickstart gets to take advantage of these features, if you already have a site using, using Drupal Commerce or don't want to use this distro as your base, 
you can still grab these modules and, uh, and, and install them, configure them, and have the same exact user experience for your store admins and such. And Josh actually is doing a series of videos called Commerce Module Tuesday. Um, you can find those through the DrupalCommerce.org blog, um, where he's actually been showing how to install and configure these various modules on an existing uh, Drupal Commerce site. All right, and then last but not least, in the back end of Commerce Kickstart, we have this connector to what we call the Commerce Marketplace. The Commerce Marketplace is sort of the place to find um, vetted and, uh, and hand-picked integrations with third-party services um, that, that we have partnerships with. Um, so you'll see in here, Giraffe uh, is our partner for e-commerce uh, analytics on-site. Um, our other partners include payment gateways, um, performance uh, services, sales tax calculation services, and many of these folks are actually in our booth right now in what we call the Commerce Village, which is our effort to bring um, e-commerce service providers to you at DrupalCon. Um, so we go to trade shows where they have huge booths and they reach out to the whole general commerce community, um, but they typically haven't had a representation at Drupal conferences, even though other parts of the sort of uh, Drupal environment have. So there have been hosting companies at DrupalCons for some time now. Well, now we're saying, well, let's bring some of these e-commerce companies um, to uh, the conference as well to get to know you, to get to talk about their integrations in Drupal, to talk about uh, you know, their prices and, and their, their business models and their offerings, so that whenever you go to launch your next e-commerce site using Drupal Commerce, uh, you'll have them here ready to plug in right into your website. And you can search them, find them right through the back end. And what's great about this is that some of these services like Giraffe actually have registration APIs. So you, as a developer, can create an account on the Commerce Marketplace and then go and register any site that you're building for Giraffe and manage all of your API keys for all of your client sites through one um, user interface within the Commerce Marketplace itself. Um, additionally, the, the connector module here will eventually be able to um, create that all in line and configure the modules for you right from the back end of Commerce Kickstart. Again, this is part of our effort to make it faster, simpler, and easier for you to get a new e-commerce site up running as quickly as possible. And if you look at some of our competitors, Magento does something similar um, with their, their Magento Go platform and the Magento Connect ecosystem. Or at a sort of meta level, Google does the same thing with Google Apps. It's all about uh, sort of embedding into um, the interface you're, you're already using a way to connect to a variety of additional services and add-ons for the site. <coughs> so let's go back to the slides. Uh, because I just have you know, one more little slide here that says, hey, come join us um, at the Commerce Village. Um, we have um, these partners here with us at the conference, and they are doing demos. They're you know, offering whatever they have to offer. Uh, they're, they're explaining themselves and their integrations into Drupal, and it's a great opportunity for you to actually talk directly to these companies and say, you know, what would make your life as a merchant or as an e-commerce integrator easier, and hear from them what they have coming down the pipe. In fact, one of these at least just launched, um, the American Express Payment Gateway is a brand new service from Amex that our team in the UK has been able to integrate, and then they're here to talk about that at the conference. Um, so come find us at the Commerce Village We're in the back right-hand corner of the exhibit hall, and uh, we'll at least be having beer on Thursday afternoon. So come join us for that, if nothing else. Um, so what else are the next steps for Drupal Commerce? Um, we're, we're looking at uh, you know, continuing to expand the, the suite of products and services around Drupal Commerce to make it easier for you to sell commerce to your, your clients and make it easier for us to communicate about to the broader um, sort of e-commerce um, e world. One of the things that everybody asks about are what about mobile integration? Not just responsive design, but actually native mobile apps that can take advantage of phone hardware, that can take advantage of push notifications and other hooks that the operating systems offer. And so our, our first implementation of this is the Commerce Mobile offering. Again, developed in, in partnership with Summit Kataria, and he'll be demoing this at our booth. And the idea is that uh, this will connect directly to your site and pull down product data, um, order history data if the user is logged into the app, and give you as the administrator the, the ability to push out through rules, push notifications to the device, you know, um, you know, advertising special offers or eventually making personalized offers to different um, customers within your store. So maybe it's a discount code for someone that hasn't placed an order in two months or something. That sort of functionality can be rigged up through the rules module, set to run on cron, and then you can actually use the mobile app to start to, to drive more sales to the website itself. And so 
It's tools like this that we want to bring to bear so that everybody else can uh, take advantage of these to, to sell Drupal Commerce um, to all the different merchants that you have access to that we'll never hear from. And that's actually been one of the, the coolest things about doing Ubercard and then Drupal Commerce is that there, there are combined about 75,000 e-commerce sites using this software. And I've personally talked to maybe like 75 of them. Um, so, so by a factor of 1,000, there, there's so much more going on with e-commerce on Drupal than, than I or commerce guys will ever be able to touch. Um, but we want to continue to develop the framework and the sort of ecosystem of tools that you are, are, are much better equipped to, to win these projects and work in partnership with commerce guys to deliver them. And so if there's something like the Commerce Mobile that we don't offer or that, com that Drupal Commerce, the framework, doesn't do, I'd love to hear from you. Um, it's it's, it's uh, much better as an open source community when we're not just an echo chamber for the guy that's releasing stuff. When we can actually hear back from the community how it's meeting your needs or not meeting your needs. It helps us make the next version even better and you know, helps Drupal continue on its path toward becoming the number one open source e-commerce platform in the world. All right. Um, so the last thing here is the commerce platform. This will be a hosting platform that's specifically tooled um, to host commerce sites. Uh, it is, um, uh, I guess, working through Amazon Cloud Services to, uh, to sort of rethink how um, cloud and agile hosting can work uh, for you. So I, I strongly encourage you to get a demo from Damien because he's, he, uh, he's the one that can best communicate how the, uh, I guess, the, the lack of a paradigm that that platform uh, sort of forces you into is a benefit for you. So um, it's, it's basically a hosting platform uh, that lets you spin up new development environments using Git branching and managing all of your environments as separate branches with uh, basically forked, um, forked file systems and databases and then merges back upstream, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I hope that's not over um, folks' head in the site building track. Um, but just suffice it to say that the platform is trying to rethink the way that we are um, building and then launching uh, websites using Drupal, um, kind of escaping um, maybe some of, the, some of the, the limitations or restrictions of the uh, dev staging prod um, environments that we're used to. So I um, strongly encourage you to get that demo from Damien, and then I do believe that comes with a free beer ticket or something at the end of it as well. Um, because again, it's actually much easier to find beer at DrupalCon Portland than it is to find water, uh, if anybody. <laughs> Or coffee, yeah. <laughs> Just the way it should be. <laughs> it is the city for that. Um, so let's talk about Drupal Commerce uh, 2.x, and then I'll I'll break for Q and A, and then we'll break for beer and coffee and water. Um, so the Drupal Commerce, uh, uh, what's what's the best thing to say here? How to how to dive in? I think the, the, the fact that Drupal Commerce is both a core framework and a, a sort of complementary distribution um, becomes confusing when you look at the version numbers. Um, people look at Commerce Kickstart 2.x and think that is the second version of Commerce. But Commerce Kickstart 2.x actually uses Drupal Commerce 1. Uh, and then there is a Commerce Kickstart 1 that's, that's much more bare bones and minimal. Um, but it's still just Drupal Commerce 1. And then in Drupal 8, we'll have Drupal Commerce 2 and ostensibly Commerce Kickstart 3. Who knows how it'll work out? But basically what I'm talking about here is the next version of the core framework. Um, so um, the, the sort of like core store order, um, customer payment entities, et cetera, and all the systems that go with them like shopping cart and checkout, all that stuff is going to be re-architected and, and, and updated for Drupal 8. Um, so this will sort of run through some of the changes, but it's important to note that um, development of the next version of the framework doesn't really begin in Drupal Commerce itself. It actually began in Drupal Core. Uh, so for the last, I, I don't know exactly how long, last year, year and a half, um, Chris Vanderwater is a, a commerce guy working from his home in Oklahoma as an initiative lead for the core of Drupal 8. Um, he's been heavily involved in the plugin system, um, the new blocks and layout system for Drupal 8. Um, so a lot of our contributions to that was facilita is, is facilitating what we hope to do with Drupal Commerce on Drupal 8. Uh, but not only that, there's also the entity reference module. Um, so Drupal Commerce was, was the primary test case for um, architecting a major contributed module for Drupal 7 using the entity system and fields and references and all that. 
And at the time, there was no entity reference module, so we included in Drupal Commerce a product reference field, a customer profile reference field, and a line item reference field. And because they were sort of like each successive implementations of the same idea, they got progressively better, uh, so that I think the line item implementation is probably the worst, and maybe the product implementation had the most love, uh, but you know, there, there's just some inconsistencies there, and that was just a result of the APIs developing and then commerce developing, and it's all very organic and messy. Um, but thankfully, during the course of Drupal 7, um, at Commerce Guys, we were able to build the entity reference module um, when prototyping a client site, and that module far eclipsed um, actually the commerce usage stats, so there's something like twice as many uh, sites using the entity reference field as there are using Drupal Commerce. Uh, so for Drupal 8, uh, we were actually able to get the entity reference field module into core. Uh, so by focusing on getting entity reference in there, and Andre Matisku is one of our, our prime sort of pushers for that within Commerce Guys, we now will be able to deprecate thousands of lines of code from Drupal Commerce itself. We'll no longer have to manage that because Drupal Core will do it for us. And so we really sought out ways that we could contribute to the Drupal 8, um, Drupal 8 timeline and roadmap so that we had less and less code in Drupal Commerce. And really, as far as I'm concerned, the most successful Drupal Commerce 2.0 release will involve the least amount of code necessary. So that's, that's why we really focused on building into the plugin system, the entity API, the field system, we, we had guys contributing to getting views into core so that we can take advantage of this code and get rid of a lot of code out of the commerce modules themselves. We will open the 2.x branch uh, for Drupal Commerce once we have a minor release out of Drupal 8. Um, Dries said that an alpha release of Drupal 8 is coming soon. So as far as I'm concerned, when that happens, um, I will be comfortable opening the new branch and beginning to, to re-implement our commerce entities and field relationships and views plugins, et cetera, et cetera, on uh, Drupal 8. Um, so that should happen any day now. And then I guess Drupal 8 will maybe be ready by the end of the year. And we hope to have a Drupal Commerce 2.0 beta version or higher by that time. And then when we think about what's actually going to happen in Drupal Commerce, obviously the big thing is we will re-architect around the new features of Drupal 8 itself. Um, so we, we're really excited to, to get rid of some of our dependencies like the Entity API. The will no longer be necessary because the Entity Metadata Wrapper that we leverage so heavily within our modules is now a core part of Drupal 8. So we'll be able to change all of the code that interacts with that, especially as it pertains to manipulating field data and dealing with multilingual sites. A lot of that will change, but it's for the better, and it's actually really exciting to be able to re-architect this now and stop you know, dealing with all the issues that we sort of endlessly crop up in the issue queue about one more part of the Drupal Commerce interface that isn't translatable or that translates to the wrong language or something. Um, so we've had some pretty fun uh, localization issues because of that. And we also want to address common configuration and development challenges. Uh, and one of the refrains that you hear is that um, people still choose to use Ubercart because it allowed them to create a product that had a lot of attributes and options without forcing them to use a, a unique SKU for every different combination. Um, now, I, I would say, well, that's bad data to have all these anonymous changes to the same product but not know what variations actually exist. But the, the critique of the user interface within Drupal Commerce itself is fair. We should be able to have the same architecture but make it easier to manage and build out large groups or what we're going to call product hierarchies um, within the core of commerce uh, without having to revert to some sort of you know, old software that doesn't really give you uh, great data and, uh, and has you know, much smaller GIS system, et cetera, et cetera. Again, like I said, we want to kill it. So um, it's like I'm trying to put down my old dog so my new dog can flourish. Uh, and it's not happening fast enough. But, um, and the, the other thing we want to do is that sort of a pro uh, apply a broader set of development emphases to the sort of broad, I guess, uh, core of um, the commerce modules. And let's just skip this slide because I kind of already mentioned timeline and actually look at what those development emphases are. So this kind of, this first one here actually goes uh, along with what Dries presented in his keynote and what I think makes Drupal 8 really exciting. It's the idea that, um, that we don't have to do everything within Drupal and certainly when it comes to e-commerce we can't do everything within Drupal. Um, so let's make sure that Drupal and Drupal Commerce is, is a very, a, a mighty fine data conduit, not just a container, not just the sole source of all of your e-commerce data and the sole point of manipulation for all these things, but, but make it a much better channel to put 
you know, uh, your customer data into your CRM and send your order data out to your fulfillment system and, you know, provide uh, your analytics um, service with all of the different, uh, I guess, user behaviors and interactions on the site so that you can depend on all of these sort of best of, best of breed or best in class services to uh, continue to improve your store and improve your conversion rates and reduce abandonment rates, et cetera. So I really, really look forward to seeing how Drupal 8 enables this thanks to things like the REST module. So out of the box, we will have, uh, um, uh, I guess, out of the box, we'll have REST resources for all of our commerce entities and better tools for consuming data from remote web sources. So there are things like that happening in the core of uh, Drupal 8 that should make it easier for us to use Drupal Commerce as that, that data conduit and then provide much better integrations with these uh, services that we're bringing to the marketplace and maybe the ones that don't exist yet. Um, additionally, I want to really serve the majority use case in a much better way. Um, how, how many folks here have actually launched uh, Drupal Commerce sites so far? All right, so yeah, dozens of you have done it. And I'm sure that, that maybe, um, maybe at least one of you has, has been befuddled by the shopping cart refresh happening every single time the order gets loaded. Or maybe somebody else has wondered, why can't I just, uh, why, why can't I write a piece of code that can manipulate a product price? Why does everything have to be done through rules? And that's, that's a, a common question. Another one might be shopping cart revisions or checkout revisions. Why am I getting a new revision of my order every time something gets added to the cart or the user progresses through the checkout form? And a lot of these features or yeah, a, lot, a lot of these features were added in to really kind of serve the most complex use case imaginable. So for example, we thought, well, it'd be, it'd be really nice to be able to see exactly when the customer abandoned the checkout process and capture all of their data as soon as possible. So we have you know, really aggressive revisioning strategy for orders during the cart and checkout process. But for the average user, um, what they found out was that their database was just filling up with all of these rows of, of entity revisions and field revisions, and they, they really had no good way to take advantage of that data. So it was just useless data taking up space and preventing them from maybe making some other customization or configuration. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, it just didn't serve them at all. And then come to find out, we could actually integrate with someone like Giraffe and provide, I guess I didn't actually show this screenshot, but we can actually provide in the back end of um, Drupal Commerce a dashboard that's actually going to show you, you know, a funnel of who's visiting, who's shopping, who's added to the cart, at what point of the checkout process did they abandon the uh, uh, abandon ordering from you? What are your click-through rates and your conversion rates and your abandonment rates? All that stuff that we thought, oh, we need to have all of this data in the Drupal database. So let's be really aggressive about revisions. Well, it turns out it's much better and much easier and, uh, you know, a much uh, more powerful experience for the merchant to just provide integrations with services like Giraffe or, you know, if you're using it, Google Analytics, MailChimp has their e-commerce 360 analytics, these other things. So let's stop trying to do everything within the core commerce modules themselves and instead focus on serving the majority use case better. Um, so has anybody actually used sell price pre-calculation? You actually have used it. One guy, two guys out of the dozens of hands that were raised. Um, if, if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably like less than 1% of our users use this, this uh, ability of Drupal Commerce to look at all of your pricing rules and then um, sort of compile to the database all of the dynamic prices that are possible on your site. So we could literally take a, take a site of 1,000 products and, and look at all of the different pricing rules in place, maybe there's a dozen of them, and then generate a million, two million rows in the database that have all of these dynamic prices calculated out with, that, are, that are keyed by the different conditions and context, et cetera, where those prices might, um, you know, might, might be, uh, I guess might be used or would come to bear. And that was done so that you could have views that could actually sort and filter by calculated prices, not just the price of the product stored in the database. But well, the problem is it serves three people in this whole room of users while, while everybody else just wants to be to have a simpler sell price calculation process. But we sort of, we limited the, the broader process to serve that, that edge case. And so I, what I want to do is find those places within Drupal Commerce where we can better serve the majority use case. And I, and I know that we haven't hit them all. If you go look at uh, drupalcommerce.org slash roadmap, um, you can see at least the ones that I'm aware of. But I know we haven't hit them all. So we'd love to hear from you. What, what is this, uh, you know, where are the areas where we have sort of preemptively or prematurely um, sort of optimized for the power user um, and not better, not, you know, properly served the, the majority user? So I'd love to hear from you on that. So that's a, a sort of broad emphasis that will, you know, have implications across the shopping cart system, checkout, price calculation, tax, order management, and all those things. We also want to continue our, our march to using explicit configuration instead of sort of implicit magical behaviors. 
Um, and I'm not sure how long some of you have been using Commerce, but if you recall, before we had our uh, 1.0 release, it used to be that if you wanted a product attribute field, like the size of a shirt or the color of a coffee mug or something, um, you just had to you just had to kind of know what field types would work as attribute fields, and you had to know that they could only be single value. And I think there's there's one other thing, like three different magic configuration parameters that had to be just so in order for in order for that field to work as an attribute field. Well, eventually we, we realized that that was just not usable at all. Nobody got it, and, you, and we couldn't throw enough documentation and video tutorials at it to make sense of it. So I was like, oh, well, we could just add a simple checkbox that says, make this an attribute field, and only show the checkbox for those, um, for those cases where, it, where it's a possibility. And whenever we realized that and made it explicit, we suddenly stopped having support requests about how to add new attribute fields to products. Um, so that was... Um, a case of, of using implicit magical behavior and then switching that to explicit configuration and making it much easier for site builders and store administrators to understand what's happening with their site. Um, so we, we want to continue to find those areas. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any that are, that, are, that are sort of common problems, but if you are, I'd love to, for you to come comment on the roadmap or, or add a post to the issue queue. And let's continue to snuff these out. And my hunch is that a, a lot of the sort of magical behavior and implicit functionality is at this point probably happening in some of the major contributed modules that people are using for commerce. Um, so I don't know all of those. I'd love to hear from you um, where we can do better there. And then finally, um, the last emphasis would be to, to actually build and use robust internal APIs. Um, one, one of the things that happens in Drupal module development is that uh, we realize that, that administrators are commonly interacting with our data um, through forms. And so a lot of data manipulation, saving, updating, deleting, etc., happens directly in form submit handlers or in form validation handlers. Um, the problem is if you then want to use that same code somewhere else, say in a rules action, you have to kind of copy and paste that code over to your rules code. Uh, and then, you know, if somebody's writing a migration plugin, then they may have to copy the same code, et cetera. And it kind of, kind of just, it, it, it does not serve our developers well to, to put all of this, um, all of this data manipulation in these various callback functions. Much better would it be for commerce to have robust internal APIs that you could then um, invoke from form submit handlers and from uh, views plugins and from rules callbacks and all that stuff. So one of the clear cases where this needs to happen is with the pricing API. Um, right now, it's, it's a pain for folks to write code that, that um, directly manipulates prices because you can't just change the amount on the price field. You also have to write a price component that kind of keeps everything in sync so that when you go to grab the total of an order, um, you aren't left with, uh, with a unit price on a line item that mismatches the, the total price and then isn't reflected in the order total. And I, I guess that could have used a diagram. But the idea is it's actually difficult uh, to manipulate and customize um, product pricing right now. But we can fix that with Commerce 2.x. And there are other places where we can fix this as well. And this will kind of tie back into the first emphasis, which is Drupal Commerce as a data conduit. When you deal with, um, with web services requests and exposing your data um, in custom, um, uh, custom REST resources, it helps to have that API ready so you don't then have to reproduce the code yet again and translate it into something that, that your mobile app or web service or whatever it is can use. All right, so let's talk about actual tasks and uh, integration that needs to happen. Um, in Drupal 8, I've already mentioned, we have the entity reference field. So we'll drop thousands of lines of code from the product reference, customer, and line item modules. Uh, and we will just depend on that core field. And then if we need to, um, write widgets and formatters for them. But if we depend on the inline entity form module, uh, we may not even have to write any custom widgets at all. Um, in fact, one of our widgets got moved into Drupal 8 itself, the, the, hidden, um, the, the, the hidden form or the hidden widget or whatever, what, I can't remember the name of it, but in Drupal 8 you can have um, just a, a, a field that is not in the form at all by using the hidden widget. Well, that came from Drupal Commerce because some of our sites had product reference fields that literally reference tens of thousands of products. Um, it's uh, Eurocenters.com is the prime use case. And so we said, well, it's not going to work for them to have this uh, HTML document that lists out 10,000 product IDs in a select list. Um, so we, we just created this hidden widget for them. Now it's a part of core, more code that we'll be able to remove from the product reference module. And so it's really exciting to me to see just how much we will we'll be able to get rid of. Again, we'll have views in core, um, better entity API supporting core, so we'll be able to remove a lot of our helper functions. Um, 
and then we'll, we'll you know, update all that stuff. Um, actually have the shopping cart block and shopping cart form use views completely instead of use custom callbacks that just embed views. So a lot of these things are in the roadmap. They're in the task list. I encourage you to go and look at the task list and see if you know, your, your pet issue is not represented because I'd love to hear from you and consider what we could do to, to better address your concerns. Um, we also need to convert our commerce data structures like taxes and checkout panes um, to the core plugin system. And last but not least, add a new entity type to Drupal Commerce. So Drupal Commerce 2.x will have the, the understanding of a store. Right now, a store in Drupal Commerce is really just the site. And that makes it a challenge for people that are implementing multi-store cases, like a, a marketplace site. Um, because, the, because you kind of have to then think, well, what, what actually does represent the store? And how do I do access control for products in this store? Or make sure that payment goes to the right person? Or make sure that products get grouped together um, logically? So we're going to add the store entity type in some uh, configuration for you to be able to, uh, to, to rig up that, uh, that multi-store or multi-seller um, e-commerce site more easily. All right, and then there are some existing areas inside of Drupal Commerce that we will target for improvement. Let's just throw these all up on the screen. Um, so product hierarchy and group management I've already mentioned, uh, but we actually want to erase um, the, the administrative complexity of managing products and product displays. And we'll do that by actually allowing products, but not requiring them, to function as displays themselves. And actually to function as, as displays for an entire hierarchy of the product catalog. Um, so you can set up a, a product hierarchy that um, puts your attribute fields in there and will, um, I guess, sort of set a token pattern for SKUs and then create whole batches of products at once manage them all together and then sort of put on each individual product, um, you know, it's going to point to its parent product. So you'll always know, um, you know, what, what, uh, what front end URL to point to. Now, a, a product wouldn't have to have a, a front end product display. You can still have this um, sort of comp the existing uh, model of all of my products are defined on the back end and I use the node to actually reference and display the product. But we actually want to move more toward just using the product entity type itself to manage product displays. And, and not requiring this separation, and certainly making it easier to manage groups. So that there's an existing contrib called the bulk product creation module, and that facilitates creating a whole group of products at once, and then using the SKU patterns based on your attribute fields to get all the different variations created and tied to one display. We want to solve that in core. And uh, I don't think it's on Drupal.org yet, but we do have some whiteboard diagrams of things and ideas to make this happen. Um, but obviously looking for feedback on that as we um, push to implementation. Um, we also want to put the customizable products module into core. Uh, so right now there is the commerce underscore custom underscore product module um, that facilitates creating multiple product line item types and having those, those sort of anonymous customizations that don't require a new SKU. So when you think about registering for DrupalCon, you have to tell them if you're a vegetarian or eat, eat, uh, eat kosher or eat halal or whatever it is, that was a field on your registration line item type. Um, same for, for hearing impaired, speech impaired, et cetera. All those things were just fields on your line item type. And we're saying that the product itself was the, the, uh, the conference ticket, um, but there were these other aspects of your registration that should have been tracked and managed alongside of your registration, but didn't result in a different skew um, they, weren't, they, they didn't need to, to track inventory of, of, of uh, well, I guess they, yeah, you know, it's separate. Anyways, the idea is that, that customizable products will be um, a core, a, a much more improved core feature. Um, and, and the goal there, again, is to uh, reduce the administrative complexity of managing these sort of um, product kits or product building scenarios like the computer scenario, you know, choosing my hard drive, choosing my display, all that, without requiring administrators to use thousands and thousands of SKUs um, if, if you don't need to um, based on how your, your site is built. We want to improve the checkout form and the add to cart forms. Um, they aren't... Uh, I guess maybe they degrade right now um, um, if JavaScript is disabled, but it's a very ugly degradation. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not really working that great. And we think we have some ideas to improve the core AJAX system uh, to make it easier to embed actual buttons to trigger the updates instead of always depending on on changes and all that stuff. So um, that's listed in the roadmap. There are various uh, bullet points um, for ideas to improve that. Um, also, the add to cart form itself. Has anybody actually looked at the code for the add to cart form? Yeah, yeah, I see some grins too, right? Because it's like a thousand lines of code or something. 
Um, and that's because the form builder itself actually builds in a lot of that, that awareness of, all right, what are my attribute fields? How do I group the products in this group together so that um, my dependent attributes work properly and all that stuff? Like all that should really be an API function that the form is using to say, if I, given this set of products and this maybe map of, of chosen options, you know, how would you build this form? Um, so we really want to improve the API there and drastically reduce the footprint of that form because it can be quite a bear to, uh, to customize or to alter. So that's been a pretty common complaint. And I'm sorry. Um, also with payment methods, um, many of you would be aware that uh, in Drupal Commerce, uh, we wanted to make sure that any payment method could be instan instantiated any number of times. So with Ubercard, I had it so that you configured a payment module, and that was it. You could have that appear or not appear on the checkout form or um, on the order administration form. But what if you needed two different sets of API credentials? Well, at the time, you just would have had to like copy the module, rename all the functions, and then sort of have a separate payment method that was really just the same thing, but just kind of renamed. But here, we've actually used rules to say you can instantiate any different number of uh, PayPal website payment standard instances. So um, maybe you have one account for um, regular transactions, one account for microtransactions. You could actually use the rules module to decide which one appears on the checkout form. Um, so you can actually swap in API credentials based on any aspect of the order or um, even change the, uh, the payment method entirely. So we, we do this a lot in Europe where we have one payment gateway for France, one for Germany, one for the UK, and then maybe one for everywhere else in the world. Um, that kind of thing was facilitated through rules and through the way that we built the payment system. But it turns out that storing your payment method configuration in rules actions makes it really difficult to get at. So it's, it's, hard, to, um, it's hard to alter that stuff, for example, because there is no like, real clear point where we're loading the data from the database with a natural place to invoke an alter hook. So we want to address that and make it function more like the shipping module does. So with my flat rate shipping module, you define your flat rate services in one place, and then you just use rules to turn on a particular flat rate service. So we want to be able to say, define your payment methods in one place, and then just use rules to turn it on, so you can still have any number of instances, but where and how you manage that configuration is, one, easier for merchants, and then two, also, um, I guess, better to work with from a data standpoint. We'll address some currency and address formatting issues. Those are listed out in the roadmap. Um, we'll certainly address, as I've already mentioned, pricing rules and the complexity involved there. Um, basically saying that if you aren't using pre-calculation, there's no reason you shouldn't have a hook uh, to directly manipulate product prices. So let's let that happen. And then finally, we'll actually finish our full revision support and introduce the concept of revision tagging. Um, so even though we have you know, an order revision for every step of the checkout process, it's actually difficult to come back at a later time and say, when did this customer actually complete checkout? Um, because you don't actually have good insight um, into the different revision timestamps and what changed from one revision to the next. So it's hard to say, well, did the order status change to commerce or to checkout complete? And then depending, and what was the timestamp from that, and how do I get at that data? That, that's actually difficult to, to manage right now. So we want to actually uh, sort of ev evaluate the concept of tagging revisions so that um, we have just a sort of single abstract API to, to tag product and order and customer profile revisions for use and an easy reference at a later point in time. And so then the last question I'll answer is where do you fit in? Um, and basically I'll say that if you're interested in contributing to development, let's talk um, after the session, whether in here or at the booth. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback. I'd love for you to, to read the roadmap. It's at drupalcommerce.org slash roadmap and see what's missing from your experience and see how we can better serve those four emphases. What are ways that we can make Drupal function better as a data conduit? Um, what are ways that we can build and use robust internal APIs? Um, how can we solve the common configuration and development uh, sort of problems? And then I can't remember the fourth, but I'm sure it was good. Um, so let's talk about how we can, can more broadly apply those things, um, more, more, uh, more uh, specifically take advantage of the Drupal 8 APIs. I only know so much of what's going on, and I'm sure that there are many of you in the room that know more of different parts of it than I do, so I'd love to hear from you. And then uh, finally, if you haven't actually used Drupal Commerce yet, uh, I'd love for you to give Kickstart 2 a try. So you can use my computer, you can use the booth computers, and, um, and just get to know, you know how it works. We'd love to hear what you think. And certainly we'd love to see you um, using the marketplace uh, to launch new stores you know, quickly, happily, funnily, whatever. Um, I intend to do it here soon for Real Milk Cheese and then also some other local, uh, uh, local merchants there in Greenville. Um, and 
you know, I'm always on the lookout for my next uh, e-commerce site idea. So um, let's go on to Q&A time. We do have a microphone here um, that you can use. Are there, are there any questions about roadmap or about kickstart functionality or anything else that I may have mentioned? If not, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. If so, it wouldn't either. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so uh, I've taken a look at commerce and kickstart. I, I really like the flexibility of commerce um, and how it can apply to different business models. I looked at Kickstart um, as a means to sort of derive what the best practices are for commerce. Yeah. And uh, one thing, and I think this is the first I've heard of the product hierarchies. Okay. And so I, th I think this question is going to pertain to that. But one thing that struck me as odd was it seemed as though commerce was, there was a lot of coupling between products and nodes. Yeah. And commerce was using nodes as a rendering engine for the products. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to facilitate that, there was a lot of sugar that Kickstart added to Drupal to sort of make sense of that process. Yeah. So one example is if you go to look at node entities, um, there is a column that is added product displays yeah. with a flag yes or no. Yeah. So you can sort of see, you know, there products are adding sort of a, a mess of entities to, I'm not only looking at nodes, I'm sort of also dealing with right. commerce and with products. And so I'm just wondering if that's going to be addressed yeah, in that's, the future, so that's, if that's going to stay, if hierarchies are, are involved or, or dealing with that issue. Yeah, that's, that's basically why we decided to, to go with this, this uh, concept of product hierarchies and using like the top of the hierarchy, the top of the pyramid as the display directly instead of using a separate entity type um, was because Kickstart um, we, was our first pass at how to make it more understandable and it's resulted in more confusion um, because w we, we kind of um, erased the distinction between a product type and a node type within Kickstart so that we were treating them very close together. Like you said, it's just the sugar that, that couples them together even to the point of um, changing the, the uh, admin UI of the content type screen and moving menus around and adding you know, uh, options to the form. So, our thought there was, well, maybe we can just erase the distinction entirely and make it easier for merchants because they'll just have to go create their new page or create a new product type or something and do all this stuff in the background. But that, that was like, you know, semi-magic implicit behavior. We're trying to get rid of that with the explicit configuration. So um, I, I, I didn't prepare anything in the slides that actually shows how we conceive of the hierarchy working, the configuration for that working. Um, but I do have that if you're curious um, to look at it afterwards. So I am. Thank you. Uh, great. Any plans for the, abi uh, the ability to do one-page checkout? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I guess I, maybe I need to know something more from you, and that is how does it not do one-page checkout now? Is it not? Oh, okay. Well, I, up to this point, I thought that you couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. No, no, you can. Oh, you um, can. So, within uh, Drupal Commerce, you have a drag-and-drop checkout yeah, form builder. The default, yeah. To one page, then? Yeah, the default configuration is to use multiple pages, but you can make it work on one page. Okay. We use the sort of two-step thing by default mm -hmm. um, because the, um, the sort of like cart contents part of the checkout form doesn't update to show taxes like as you enter an address. And the review page gives us that opportunity to show, oh, and taxes were added to your order, by the way and then have the point, the point of departure for payment. Um, but some, so maybe there's some stuff that we can do to make sure that the checkout form is, is updating itself as addresses are being entered. But um, you know, a, a, good, um, a good example of that would be the, the shipping module does support like on-page recalculation of shipping services as you put in your address. So if we duplicated that perhaps for the cart contents and taxes, you could have you know, a fully one-page uh, checkout form. Um, but so it, so it more or less does right now, but depending on the type of things you're doing in the checkout process, maybe it doesn't work for you. So maybe we can do it better. Yeah, but, probably yeah. just misunderstanding one point. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So a lot of the 2.x features look great, and they look like they're going to alleviate a lot of point, uh, points of friction I've experienced yeah. with 1.x. Um, the inevitable question is, what's the upgrade path going to look like? Is, is there going to be one, or... When say I'm the, trying to find someone to field that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is the data, or, or even is the data <laughs> modeling structure going to be really significantly different? Like, what can you just comment a little bit to that? Point? Yeah, I mean, I, last I heard, Drupal 8 wasn't even going to have like an upgrade path, uh, meaning instead of trying to, to do everything through update hooks, 
let's start to treat updating from one major version to the next as a migration. Um, so in that regard, I, w I would view moving from a Drupal 7 commerce site to Drupal 8 with commerce as a migration. Um, m the, the basic data model of we have these five entity types, we'll actually have six and two, but we have these entity types and they have certain properties and fields, that's not going to change. Um, I don't know if the field schema has changed significantly for Drupal 8 or if it's just the API that has changed. Um, but, but a lot of the, the data storage should be um, very close to similar so that the upgrade path could be easy. But I, but I don't even know what it's going to look like from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 without commerce. So I can't really um, say. The, the, biggest, the biggest departure, of course, is going to be this uh, idea that you'll no longer have to have a node to display a product. But that's not to say you couldn't still do that. So maybe what we end up doing is um, all of the stuff that we do now for product field injection. Um, I, don't, I don't see any reason for us to necessarily remove that from core. So maybe, maybe we still just support on Drupal 8 uh, the ability to embed product entities into nodes and have all the field injection, all that stuff work just like it did before, um, but, but then also introduce the new way to do it without deprecating the old way. Like, there's no reason we couldn't do that. The code's already written and it already works. And I assume the data model is going to be similar enough to accomplish that and probably be even, even easier. Um, so I'm, I'm, in th I'm a, so optimistic. Um, optimistic, but I don't have any hard answers. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I know it was uh, kind of briefly addressed, but with the mobile uh, application that you're, yeah. you're, you're talking about, um, is that something where we are going to just say, hey, here's a connection into my, my site, and then just tell everyone, hey, go download this? Or is that something that we can take and customize on our own and extend further to then release? Yeah. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't catch any of that. Yeah, I mean, right, right now, Commerce Guys is basically functioning as the actual software publisher for the mobile apps. Okay. So we have our Apple developer account. We yeah. control the code. It's Titanium Accelerator code. Yep. And we will actually compile the apps and publish them in the App Store on behalf of the merchant. Okay. Um, all of the Drupal side code is on Drupal.org. So Commerce Services, yep. um, the, the necessary configuration to make sure that the endpoints are there, that the app is going to talk to, all that stuff is on Drupal.org itself. Um, but the, the app itself wouldn't be something that you would just go grab and compile and fiddle with. Uh, but that is something we could talk about. It's just not something we've explored yet. Okay. Um, so, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, two unrelated follow-up questions. One, the single-page checkout. Uh, if you're using certain payment uh, processors like, say, authorize.net, it's my understanding that you uh, can't have anything that's going to uh, throw a validation uh, uh, issue uh, in any of the other forms besides authorized.net. So yeah, we we did really fix that in Commerce 1.6, but I know, I know the problem you're talking about, but I'm pretty sure that's been fixed. So, so you can have that? Uh, exactly, yeah. If, if there was an error, a validation error on one of the other checkout panes, then we'd no longer s attempt to submit the payment pane. So it okay. actually looks in forms that are, tries to find any errors, and then halts the, uh, the one-page checkout form submission if it finds something. So you don't have those like bunk, bogus transactions coming right. through anymore. So is that, is that a property of auth the authorized.net payment module? No, or? it's just part of core commerce itself now. Um, okay. But this is pretty recent, so it's not, yeah. Well, um, well, we'll go back and <laughs> make sure we got the latest and greatest. Cool. Um, okay, and then the other was, I, I thought I remember from a year or two back, uh, the idea of one of the ideas of having no displays separate from products was that would facilitate uh, multilingual sites. Yes. Is that, is that something that developments in Drupal core has made uh, less of an issue, or is that yeah, not certainly, Yeah, certainly in Drupal 8, it'll be much less of an issue. Um, the, the big reason that we did that was in Ubercart, we had um, products as nodes. And if you want to do multilingual, you actually ended up with a separate instance of the node, and they were just sort of like related together. And so since all of your price and product data was on the node itself, you then ended up with synchronization issues because in duplicating the node to translate the title and the body, you also duplicated all of the e-commerce data. And so that was the initial impetus for separating out the product data from the point of display. And there, there are other reasons as well, like stock control and, and other things. But, uh, but you know, with, with Drupal 8 and with the advances in the entity translation and field translation systems, um, display, exposing the product entity itself um, should no longer be an issue when it comes to uh, the localization, multi-currency, and all that stuff, which is good. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. All right, I'll do these last two guys, and then we'll take off. Okay. Um, do you have, uh, if pricing is in a client's ERP, or if you don't know what that is, uh, accounting system, mm -hmm. um, is there a 
API that I can take that information and bring it into commerce and then deal with that? Is there a separation between their database of their pricing and their products and the presentation and the, on the website? I mean, honestly, it just really depends on the system. I, I don't really know how to answer that at a sort of abstract level. Like, it just depends. Does, does the ERP system have an API that you can consume remotely? Or are you going to have to push data to the site from the ERP system? I mean, that, that stuff is possible. And, and probably the best person to talk to would be Peter Phillip. And I, I don't think I've seen him in here. But he's the guy that built Eurocenters. And they literally, mentioned about a, they literally manage about a million products and 1,600 rules remotely, compile them into a sort of like CSV export, and then put that all into the Drupal site using feeds to keep those things synchronized. So technically, it's possible Absolutely. if the ERP system provides that information yeah. flow on a Absolutely, some yeah. sort of, OK, thanks. Yeah. And last one, and then we'll take off. Are there any uh, plans or anyone working on uh, a way to add coupons simplerly, if that's a word? <laughs> simplerly? <laughs> Um, to, to commerce? I, I guess the question is just like what, we just have to know what's difficult about it now and how to make it easier. I mean, for instance, so. if you wanted to add the ability to add coupons on particular products, you have yeah, to install yeah. four modules Use and the coupon follow, module and rules and all that. Yeah. follow the, the special steps on the coupon code by reference module yeah. page. I mean, like, part, part of that was done via Commerce Kickstart and the Commerce Discount module, um, but it's not finished. So it's actually actively being developed on Drupal Commerce. Uh, for for Drupal 7, um, and I don't I don't know exactly what needs to change about that for Drupal 8, but uh, the guy that maintains Coupon is actually here. He's from Commerce Guys. His name is Pedro, um, and he works out of our London office. I don't think he's in this room. Not he's not in this room. He had better places to be, um, but come find him at the booth, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk about roadmap and how to improve it. Okay, thank so, yeah. you. All right, thanks everyone for your time. Have a good con.